So good morning everyone, this is our sixth webinar today um, and today is all about biodiversity um, and you've, as usual, you've got myself and you've got Amy and today we're joined by Martha um, from the Wildlife Trust. Um, so Martha is going to do quite a, a chunk of today's webinar, um, kind of about what the Wildlife Trust does and some of the tips and tools that hopefully you'll find useful as well. Um, so usual sort of overview of what our webinars are like. Um, we'll give you a little bit of background about what we do um, and then lots of information about some of our projects. Um, and we're going to do two sections of questions and answers today. Um, so one after Martha's section, um, just on the off chance she's got to run off. Um, and then we've got some questions and answers at the end, if there's anything that people um, have forgotten as we've gone along. Uh, as usual, uh, just a bit of background that we run these every every Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Um, we do record them and we do put them up on YouTube and that's available on the school's extranet site. Um, if you've got any questions as we go along, um, by all means just pop them in the chat box um, and if it's something that's kind of fits in at the time then we'll answer them but if not we'll come to the Q&A uh, towards the end. Uh, a bit of background about us. Um, so we support all schools in the city on lots of environmental education work. So we do communication through social media. Uh, we do our teach meets and our roadshows and our celebration events. Uh, we focus on the Eco School Award and uh, particularly Amy and I sort of work on energy and litter projects. And in other areas, we tend to direct partnership work in um, either internal or external to the council. We are very successful with our eco schools. Um, so we've now got 49 schools at Green Flag, which nearly puts us at number one across the UK uh, in England, um, which we're really pleased with. Um, and we know that schools are still submitting for their awards at the moment. So if you've got any questions about that, by all means, ask that later on as well. Um, so just very quickly through the seven steps and how biodiversity might fit in. Um, so the first bit is with the committer. You've got your eco committer. Um, and it might be that they particularly focusing on a biodiversity project, or you might have a subcommittee who are keen at looking at biodiversity um, themselves. Within the environmental review, the seven steps fit, and um, the review um, has got a biodiversity section. So even if it's not a topic you're particularly working on to start off with, you do need to cover all 10 areas as part of the review. And if you are focusing on biodiversity, um, you do need to include that in your action plan. Um, and again, all those action plans are on the school's uh, Eco Schools website. Uh, curriculum work, lots of opportunities around developing biodiversity in the curriculum. Um, and we'll we'll talk about those in a bit more detail towards the end. And informing and involving, again, lots of opportunities to let people know about what project you've been doing in biodiversity um, around school grounds. It's a good one for getting parents involved in and coming to kind of get involved as well. And the monitoring bit, uh, we're going to do quite a bit of work today around how we monitor to do with biodiversity. Um, and I think what we've kind of picked out, I know Martha's going to talk a bit about this, is there's kind of two areas of biodiversity. First one is about increasing it. Um, however that may be and then the second bit is how you then monitor that um, and that's the kind of the key bits that we've sort of identified kind of from all the work that we're looking at today so again that'll be something we can pick up and then your eco code as always um, needs to reflect biodiversity somewhere in there if that's one of your topics that you're working on um, and just a quick reminder we've got the 10 eco topics um, so biodiversity is one of those 10 um, and it does overlap quite closely really with things like school grounds, with the marine topic um, and even things like global learning if you're looking at international biodiversity. There's lots of cross links with lots of other topics within eco schools. Um, just very briefly then, so things to think about, whole school opportunities, informing everyone about your work, lots of opportunities curriculum link, monitoring the impact. So biodiversity tends to be one of the more difficult ones about monitoring, um, but certainly photos before and after projects. Um, but we're going to give you lots of examples today about how you can do surveying, um, even if it's only on just one species or a couple of species. Um, that's really helpful to do the monitoring. And then we've got a long list of projects that we're going to mention as usual, probably way more than you'd ever get through in a school year. Um, but we want to give you lots of ideas that you can go and have a think about or things that maybe you have done in the past, but you want to go back to look at. Um, absolutely. So I'm going to pass over to Martha if that's okay. 
Uh, I think you're muted at the moment, Marcus. You might just need to unmute yourself. Um, so there's a little box in the middle just from the microphone. Yeah. Can you Excellent. hear me now? Um, yeah, we can yeah. hear you fine. Good. Um, and you might just, what you need to do is just give me a shout when you want to move on to the next slide, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I expect some of you uh, know me already. I'm Martha, Senior Education Officer for Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust. Thank you for having me today. Just to say that probably like many of you, I have my children here, <laughs> so I might get interrupted, but hopefully I've left them with enough activities um, to do. Uh, so yeah, Lee asked me to talk a bit about um, biodiversity in the school grounds. Um, I have to say that actually I'm not a, an expert on this. Um, my colleague Matthew, who did the school grounds um, webinar, probably knows a lot more about planting and things like that than I do. Um, so I'm happy to take questions that I can put to him if I can't answer any for you today. Um, but obviously the Wildlife Trust, our mission is to protect and enhance the wildlife and wild places of the two counties and engage people with nature. So we're all about wanting to increase biodiversity wherever it is, not just on our nature reserves, but also in urban areas um, and to connect people with nature as well. So we want to benefit wildlife and people at the same time. Um, so I've got a little a few slides on um, how uh, we can do some survey work and what you could survey as well. And I've just focused on a few uh, key wildlife friendly features or habitats that you could um, add to your school grounds if you don't have them already. This picture we've got here actually stole from Bug Life. I've been doing a bit of research um, ahead of this webinar and, and I think this is quite a nice picture because it illustrates lots of different features that you'd want in, in, in a garden or in a school grounds. Um, to attract all different types of wildlife. What isn't in this picture is um, anything for, particularly for hedgehogs, as in like a hedgehog home or something like that. So I've, I've put that later on. What I've also um, done is um, I've created quite a, a hefty document, um, but it just has lots of links and I put it in sections. Um, so focusing on the features that you can add to habitats, how you can create those, so links to to um, organisations that um, have how-to guides. And then I've also put how you could survey those habitats or areas and, and what survey work you could do. So hopefully that will be quite useful to you. Quite a few of the links in there are, are ones that Lee, I think we'll talk about um, later on as well. Uh, and then after I've talked a bit about biodiversity, I've got a, um, a few other slides on some other initiatives um, we're running as well at the moment that I don't think Matthew mentioned uh, last time. If we move on. Right, so, um, so obviously Lee was talking about surveying. So um, you want to increase biodiversity in your school grounds. That's the aim of, of, of this topic, but really you need to know where you're starting at and then to, to be able to prove, I guess, to yourselves that you've um, increased the number of species and types of wildlife that you have in your school grounds after you've created some extra homes or habitats for that wildlife. Um, and I came across, I don't know if you've seen it too, Lee, this trail and mapping um, web, uh, web page. I think it's a Scottish initiative. I don't know, can you click okay. on that and open it? Yeah, yeah. So they they have an idea of how to do a biodiversity audit. It's just one page, but I thought it was quite nice because um, prior to doing a lot of the forest school work that we now are focusing on at the Wildlife Trust, we used to run a lot of curriculum um, linked environmental education workshops. And I used to, or we still can run one called Making Space for Wildlife. And during that workshop, we'd um, get older pupils to uh, do a plan, a map plan of their school grounds and put in the features um that they're already present so you can see on the screen now as an example of one that i did to show the children so sort of doing a bird's eye view of the school grounds is it um and this website is it going to work lee yeah it's just opened the pdf is that what it should have done yes can we show that or All right. yes yeah just give me one second i'll just move Sorry. that one that's all right Don't no worry if not, i can just talk about it that's right. but it's quite, yeah, it's quite nice session. because um, it's, uh, it sort of explains how I'd also run the workshop 
Um, in this example, if we do get to see it, um, there you go. Oh, here we are, brilliant. So in this example, it, it says that you should provide a plan to the children in advance. So you've kind of created your aerial view that the children then can, can then annotate themselves. But it could be that you'd ask the children to do the whole plan themselves, depending on the age. And then they're saying, suggesting that you go through a set route around the school grounds, taking photos of all these different features that you would um, see. So that could be a log pile or a tree or a, a bird feeder or a nest box, any of those things. So they can take photos, but they could also annotate and draw them on their plan as well. So that gives you a starting point to know what features, what habitats you already have that are good for wildlife in your school grounds, but also which ones are lacking, that ones you might want to, to add. Well, that sounds good. But I thought that was quite, an, I don't know where I came across that, but that's quite a nice mm. page. Well, I'll just go back to the PowerPoint. Thank you. Fairly. Because that activity could then be repeated at the end and you could show all the extra habitats and features that are now in place um, so it could be a before and after activity so yeah. I put survey for wildlife features so these are some things I was thinking from that um, drawing earlier as well the illustration that if you don't have or you, you you want to have or you could look for in the school grounds we've got like log piles and log discs a rockery or paving slabs um, compost heap and piles of leaves, wild edges, so that's not mowing um, all the grass, but leaving some long grass and having nettle patches, etc. We've got um, bee hotels or nest boxes for bees, wildflower and herbs, uh, mini ponds, things for birds, hedgehogs, as I talked about before, even bat boxes, and then obviously the trees, hedges, shrubs, and even you could install a green roof or wall. You could put a green roof on a shed, for example. Mm -hmm. Sorry if you can hear, someone seems to be making a lot of noise out the window, so sorry <laughs> if you can hear that. <laughs> Someone's decided to start using power tools during this presentation. <laughs> that's typical, that's what I usually get as well, usually yeah. someone's outside. Yeah, I don't think we can hear it, Martha, I think you're okay, okay anyway. So sorry about that. Right, okay, if we move on, thank you, Lee. No worries. Right, so so that's that's the baseline survey. So go and find out what habitats you already have in your school grounds. So that's one area of it. But the other area is then to look for the wildlife that might live in these these areas or habitats. And so I've done a slide just on invertebrates to start with because I thought maybe some of you wouldn't have come across some of these um, surveying methods. So obviously we think we're all familiar with um, mini beast hunting and the sort of what I term the lift and look approach so looking under logs and stones etc for your um, ground um, living uh, mini beasts like beetles and slugs and worms and centipedes and things like that um, but there are some other surveys that you can get involved with so there's one um, for worms so I put dig for worms there's an opal survey that I've put in the document so you can just focus on looking at what earthworms you have present Another one which is very good and the children really enjoy is sweep netting and this you need um, longer grass for this or um, areas of nettles or cow parsley things like that. Um, so I'll talk about that a bit later but it really is fantastic if you can leave some edges wild um, because you will get a lot of different um, species living in them. Now I've put a link on the document to um, somewhere where you can buy sweep nets but they're not as you can imagine very cheap because <laughs> it's not something that people buy very often they last a very long time but there are um, some links to how you can make your own as well which obviously would be a cheaper option um, but yeah I've done this um, quite a few times with children and they do really enjoy catching things um, in the net and it's not really about um, waving them in the air to catch a butterfly it's more about um, putting them through the vegetation and seeing their different um, invertebrates that would live there um, another one that you might not have done before at school is branch shaking or I think it's called branch beating and so there's a picture here um, so again you can buy quite an expensive um, beating tray I think they're called um, but basically it is a white sheet spread over some <laughs> wood that kind of folds up so I think it I think it looked like something like 75 pounds which is seems a bit crazy 
<laughs> crazy. So I don't think you'd probably be wanting to invest in one of those. But I mean, you could just use a white sheet. So this the gentleman here is obviously holding the tray. But if you could put a white sheet under a tree or a bush and basically you, you can beat it with a stick or shake it and you'd be surprised how many invertebrates and mini beasts will you know, fall down and you, you'll find out what's living in the tree canopy. So that's quite a fun one to do, especially when they all fall into, I shouldn't say that, when they fall in your hair. <laughs> so <laughs> shake it and step back a bit. Um, so that's quite fun. And often there are things you don't expect up there, like um, earwigs and caterpillars and other things. Um, then I've got um, bee nest box monitoring. So I put some links to, you can actually buy, one's more expensive than the other, but you can buy nest boxes for solitary bees. So those are ones that don't live um, in a colony, but live on their own. And they, they um, nest in, in sort of tunnels or holes. Naturally, they'd be in, in a tree or in like an old ant or beetle hole or something. But um, increasingly, people are creating these habitats for um, solitary bees. And you can buy nest boxes where you can see actually the, the chamber that the bee is living in and that's really nice for children to see and they can be ta taken out and looked at because it is um sort of the pupa the, the baby bee that's, that's there um and then lastly something i thought you also might not have tried before is pitfall or tumble trapping and that's that's easy to do so just with a yogurt pot so that's quite a diy method and that's digging a, a hole that would be the same um, depth as the pot plastic pot that you'd use um, and it has to be flush with the ground but then you leave that overnight and then you'll find what invertebrates will be crawling around overnight basically and they'll they'll tumble they'll fall into the trap so you want to give them a bit of a soft landing with some mm -hmm. leaves and things um, but yeah I mean I did this a lot at um, university and it, it, you can get a lot of beetles and different things in there depending on where you put it Sadly, at university, it involved having to kill them to get them to species level, which I wasn't very comfortable with. But with this one, you just want to keep them alive and see uh, <laughs> kind of what type of um, invertebrate it was. Um, you can put a covering over it, I think, as well, if you're worried that um, there'll be other things that might fall in it or if it's going to rain. The best place to put um, these traps is sort of somewhere near vegetation, so not in the middle of a playing field, because you're unlikely to get much there, but somewhere where there is a bit more um, planting or cover or near a hedge or anywhere where there's um, more plants and trees. Um, I mean, I think you probably, if, you know, university you had to put X per square metre, but I think at school you could just put a few around and it'll give you an idea of what kind of um, invertebrates are, are living in your uh, school grounds and come out at, at night. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, next one. Thank you, Lee. Yeah. Shall I, is, shall I wait for questions at the end or is it, is it best, Lee, or is it, I'll go on, to, um, think, maybe after this section, before I get to the other areas, we'll see if there's any questions. Yeah, that um, sounds good, yeah. So the other things that, so obviously there's a lot you can do with invertebrates, um, lots of different methods, and then I just thought of a few others um, that you, you could also focus on. So um obviously with birds if you've got um nest boxes up you can um, monitor those by just by looking to see if birds are um coming in and out but of course you also can get birds bird nest boxes that have um cameras attached so that is something that you could i mean i'm not sure how much they cost so again money is is, is an issue but it might be something you could fundraise for um i think this one is a swift um box um which would only be suitable for tall buildings this was at hazel primary school because they've got a really nice tall victorian building um so you might want to go for a box if you were to get one with a camera that's more like a blue tip box that might be more likely to be used regularly um so that's one way to monitor birds other than um just seeing them around is to actually film them and then i've got um sort of mammals so i was thinking hedgehogs foxes badgers maybe squirrels as well that might come into your school grounds and potentially when you're not about so um, here, the children are making their own footprints on this picture in the sand, but you can quite easily create um, like a sand tray. Um, and you wouldn't want to obviously leave it out the whole time because I think some local cats might use it for something you don't want them to. But um, if you just left it out over one night and you smoothed it over, especially if you wanted to put some sort of cat food out, as long as it's not got any fish in it, 
to encourage a hedgehog or something along, then you might be able to get some prints of um, different mammals that are passing by through your school grounds uh, at night, at dusk. Mm -hmm. So that's something you could do. You can also, which I've got some links to, do um, like an ink trap as well. So you can get, um, it's like a charcoal base. You don't want to use paint, but you can get um, charcoal and mix that with, I think, a bit of oil. And again, you can quite easily make your own sort of DIY footprint trap that way as well. And you could even do that just for, if you know you get squirrels in your school grounds, it might even be able to work during the day if you were to put some nuts inside and then you, you get kind of like an ink footprint trail uh, from the different mammals. Mm -hmm. And then I've also got a picture of a camera trap. Again, cost is a problem, but you might, if you know you've got badgers coming in. I mean, I know, um, uh, is it Abbey Mead? They've got, I think they've had some problems with badgers going into their school grounds. So if you, you if you suspect that you've got a local fox or a badger or something, again, it might be, you know, throughout the school, probably a parent is going to own a camera trap and wouldn't mind lending it um, for a few nights. So it's worth thinking about putting that up in your school grounds and seeing uh, what you might get we've been fo filming the foxes on our street with with one you might only get cats you don't know but that's that's quite nice for the children um to see so that's another way to survey um them when you're not about really um obviously with uh, trees you you the easiest way to identify them is to look at their leaves and there are lots of different guides this one is the opal one but i know the woodland trust do them as well um you can learn to identify trees from their buds as well. I wouldn't try with the bark. That's very tricky. Um, but leaves or buds uh, are a good way to identify trees. And then I put in this one playing field plants, not something I'm very good at plant ID. But I know this um, field studies guide does this one to playing field plants. So I thought that might be useful to use because there aren't that many on there. It might be one that you could use if you've got a playing mm -hmm. field the children I think it's just some simple like daisies and dandelions and things so that might be worth getting hold of if you wanted to look at plants in your playing field and then um, lastly for other wildlife we've obviously got the pond dipping and I'll come on in a bit to even I think it's it's very beneficial for wildlife just to have a mini pond you don't have to have a, a big you know five meter square pond even a little a bowl a washing up bowl you'll be surprised what you might get um, living in there. So obviously you could have a net like that, but what I've used in our garden, my daughter um, created a little pond, um, which isn't much bigger. It's just, it was made out of a trug, so an old trug, so quite a small one. And she uses what we bought actually was um, from an aquarium shop, just those little nets that you get that people would use to catch their fish in a, in a tank at home. Mm. So you could, and they're, really, they're only like a few pounds. Um, so we use that because it's such a small area and that works well for pond dipping. So you don't have to have a big pond and lots of big expensive nets to, to find out what's living in there. Brilliant. Thank you, Lee. Um, I was just going to say the camera, we've got one in our office currently locked in a drawer. Um, oh. But we, we've, uh, I borrowed it from Crown Hills because we got a grant for them a few years back. Um, so they're quite happy to lend that out to schools so if you want to borrow one and they work on a motion sensor so it's yeah. kind of you leave it on um we put one in our garden we've so far caught a hedgehog and a mouse so far hey. it's, yeah it surprises you what you do actually see um yeah it's, it's quite good, yeah. exciting isn't it and yeah you can set it to i think you can set it to what timed intervals it will come on because it, it's 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 it starts recording when there's motion like you say and mm. you can record it for like one minute or up to three minutes can't you depending it's, yeah. it's definitely worthwhile if you suspect that you've got various visitors as well. But and, mm -hmm. you know, give it a go. It, yeah, we've 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 enjoyed finding what gets up comes in our garden, even if it is just a cat or a squirrel. <laughs> they are, yeah, they're really good actually. Yeah, they are worth sort of investing in. I think they're sort of probably about 150-ish pounds, so they're not yes. cheap, but no. they do they do last sort of thing. They're designed to be outdoors. They are waterproof and things, so they yeah they are worth. Just putting them somewhere out of view from uh, external visitors as well is probably worth yeah. mentioning um, from local local riffraff, let's say. <laughs> yeah. 
Excellent. Yes, the one we've got, we were lucky it was um, someone had put it up on one of our reserves. We thought probably for not good reasons to find out what they might be able to kill on our reserve. So we've got one mm. for free. So that was quite lucky uh, okay. for us. Um, so is this my last slide now on the biodiversity topic, Lee? Can't remember what I think I'm so. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. OK, oh, yeah, and there's quite well. So, um, so yeah, so that's a, so we've looked at um, sort of surveying for wildlife features and um, some of uh, the different species or groups of animals you might find in the school grounds. Uh, so when you've done that, you, you've worked out sort of what you've already got. Um, and then you might want to add a few new habitat types or features to increase the biodiversity. And then after that, you could do the same surveys again. Like Lee says, you don't have to survey all the different types of wildlife because it would take you a long time. So it is about probably focusing on a few key ones, isn't it, Lee, like invertebrates or birds or whatever you want to focus on. Um, so these were sort of the top ones I thought you might not have that you'd, you'd want to, to put in. Um, so I've already talked a bit about the solitary bee nest box. You see on the screen there, you can see the, there's some sort of yellow balls and that's the um, pupa surrounded by pollen. So the, the, the bee goes in and it lays an egg and then it leaves like um, food for the developing um, larvae to eat when it hatches out of the egg. Mm -hmm. And it's sealed up at the end. So they seal up the tube with mud or leaves and it stays there until the next sort of spring. So it matures and then it will it sort of eat its way out of the plug. So the, here you can see that you can see the actual the bees in action, as it were. Um, so the other things, obviously, I sort of mentioned as well, putting up nest boxes. There are lots of different nest, nest boxes that you can buy or make. So the obvious one is this one we've got on the picture, which is a blue tip box. Um, but different birds will want to use different boxes, so they won't be suitable for all. So I think that one will just be blue ticks and great tits. And you get open fronted boxes for a birds like robins. You get bigger boxes for starlings. You get um, groups of boxes for sparrows who like to nest together. So you want to think about what birds um, are in your local area you might have seen in the school grounds and create and put up the right bo boxes for your grounds, really, because it might be if you choose one that there aren't any birds like a swift box and it's not in the right place and it's not going to get used. So it's thinking about the right box for you and, and where where to put it as well. Um, and then I've got this sort of I've tried to get a photo of some sort of long grass. Now, I think this is probably a, a bit of a tricky issue with um, uh, contractors um, because I've seen a lot of schools contractors like to go in and they like to mow all the grass and it <laughs> looks nice and neat at the end um, and there aren't any uh, sort of margins or edges so I, I don't know how to really uh, um, particularly overcome this problem but maybe working with your premises officer but it, for those that have got playing fields um, it'd just be fantastic if uh, instead of mowing right up to the hedge or the fence um, like an even half a meter strip or a meter strip of grass was left especially if you've got the space it's amazing um, the wildlife that you could encourage and, and can live in, in those sort of wild margins. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of caterpillars, grasshoppers and other invertebrates. So um, I know there's sort of we work with the council to leave verges longer and to stop mowing those. So maybe it's something that we need to look at trying to encourage contractors not to mow every inch of grass <laughs> <laughs> within millimetres. Um, but yeah, if you can have a little, just a wild area somewhere, that's really good and can be used for the sweet netting. Um, then here, here's the pond actually you mentioned earlier, here's my daughter's pond. It's a bit hard to tell, but it, it is very small, maybe like a, a, a foot wide or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's good for children to have a small one actually, because I think often they just think that um, frogs or toads or newts live in ponds that's what the common answer you'd get I think if you ask a child what lives in a pond but actually it's home to a host of um sort of fly larvae species and that's really good um for birds that eat flies and all sorts of things so it provides a good sort of feeding station <laughs> a habitat for for food for other wildlife so if you have a small net and you dipped inside then you'd see all the wriggly little beasts that look quite alien um, and children are often quite about but 
wouldn't know that they lived there. And even if you just left out a big, as I say, washing up bowl full of water something or something, mosquitoes and things would start laying their eggs in there and you'd see um, the different stages. And that obviously feeds into life cycle work and showing how some animals look very different um, as babies to, to what they do as adults. Um, and then just lastly, I think I've got something to do with wildflowers and herbs. So even if you can just put some herbs or wildflowers in a planter, that really makes a big difference. We've got in our garden um, some cat mint at the moment. It's absolutely covered in bees and that's just one plant. So you've just had one massive cat mint plant in a pot. That would um, really help pollinators. Um, and yeah, obviously, if you want to start seeing more birds in your school grounds, and the great way is um, to feed them. But uh, it is good to do it if you're going to start to keep keep at it, really, to keep them coming. But I obviously know there's a cost involved with buying seed and nuts and finding the time to even put them in the feeders. <laughs> Excellent. Well, so, on to the next one, Martha, sorry. Yes, yeah, so this is the next one. And then if, um, I'll see if there's any questions maybe on what I've said, because I'm sort of mm. moving on. To, so I think probably most of you know about our Grow Wild team. Um, but if you are still looking for help with your school grounds and it's not something you feel, you know, you, you can do your set all on your own, then um, we've got our Grow Wild team of gardeners that um, can help you. And we worked out, I think they've worked now with a third of Leicester City schools, haven't they, helping to develop yeah. school grounds. And that's in large part down to Lee. So thank you. <laughs> He's been fantastic at helping wildlife fl flourish in school grounds in Leicester City. Um, but they can work with you on all aspects of a project. Um, and they've installed, you know, forest school areas, barefoot trails, mindfulness gardens, vegetable plots, you name it. They can turn their hand to it and they can create something from scratch um or rejuvenate an existing area and i'm probably talking far too much lee so i'll stop for that bit that's all right have, no problem have we got any um, questions on the biodiversity topic before i quickly whiz through the other slides yeah i don't have any questions if you want to either put it in the chat in box the, the or chat. there's now the option of putting your hand up if anyone's got any questions i can unmute you then but otherwise so, i'm happy to take them you know after the fact and can ask them another time yeah no, that sounds good. Yeah, I don't think there's anything in the chat box so far. Um, um, a bit that I, I just mentioned was um, about cutting grass around the edge of the fields, and it was just something yes. I just thought that we have got a plan. Um, so we're currently working with our landscape team that do quite a lot of the schools in the city about um, kind of letting schools opt out, if you like, of use of herbicides and also um, mowing regimes, so either changing how often it's cut or leaving areas so we, we're going to pilot that with a couple of schools this summer um, with hopefully then by autumn that we can contact all the schools that are in um, contract or schools that aren't they can opt into our contract um, so that that's kind of agreed but then sort of people are aware of what the implications of that are because although you do get more wildlife some people see that as it looks a bit messy and mm. kind of just making making people aware um, and actually interesting one of the things we'll talk about in a little bit is called the blue heart campaign which is about kind of leaving areas wild. So we'll we'll mention that. But yeah, that's something we're sort of working on at the moment. That'd be good. Um, Charlotte's just asked, is it okay to use uh, a kitchen sieve instead of a net for pond dipping? Yeah, you could do. Um, yeah, because I think I'm thinking about the whole size. Yeah, a sieve, like a flower sieve rather than a, uh, like a colander, I think would be mm -hmm. fine because um, because the, the larvae of all the different um, sort of fly species that will lay in there, they're going to be some of them really quite small. So the only thing would be whether they'd slip through the holes. But I think I think with that you'd catch most things. So yeah, that that's a good idea. That would work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one, um, one other thing I just thought of, uh, I didn't mention was I think you're going to go on to uh, bird surveying. But the BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology, they actually do a bird survey all year round. So you don't have to survey birds just in January or whenever it is with the RSPB. You can do it at any time with the BTO, which I've got a link. Sorry. OK, that's right. No worries. Um, Dax has just asked, um, is there a charge for Grow Wild team to come in and work at school? Yes, unfortunately, there is. So the way it's set up at the moment is they their team of gardeners that work kind of freelance for the trust. So they're not funded directly by us. So, but so they do have to charge for their time. But I think you'll probably find they are quite competitive 
compared to other sort of um, landscapers, yes, but sadly. Um, but of course, Lee is good at finding funding pots, aren't you? Yeah. For school grounds work, so it might be something um, that you could be get help with. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I know a few schools, when there was a sugar tax funding, they got funding for that. Um, and I know Seven Trent have got a funding pot at the moment. But I know Buswell's Lodge just recently was successful with. Um, so schools have kind of got ideas. We can sort of match up with funding um, and I can help to a certain degree with getting some of that funding as well. So there's there's lots of options. Just as long as you don't want it tomorrow, basically, we can look at options. Yeah, absolutely. Well, should we move on to the next bit, Martha? Is that OK? Yes, thank you. So I've just got a few other things to make you aware of, really. So um, uh, as I said at the start, we, we are focused a lot on um, forest school work at the moment um, at the Trust. Um, I manage the World Forest School project because we've had funding from People's Postcode Lottery at least four years now to run various forest school initiatives within Leicester City. And obviously since lockdown, we haven't been able to run any sessions. So we've been make, busy making um, sort of online content and I've um, created eight uh, videos, short videos on different sort of forest school inspired activities. And here's um, a list of them. So I've done different ways to run treasure hunts and various things to make. So stick butterflies, wormery, uh, this my colleague Rachel did that, a natural loom and various others. So they're available on our um, YouTube uh, channel. I think the easiest way to find it is to go to our website there, lrwt.org.uk, and then there's a like a U YouTube link. Um, do we? We don't have to play this video if we haven't got. If we're running short of time, Lee, it's up to you. Yeah, I think we might be a little bit on time, but if we've got That's time, fine. Yeah, I can come back to them after. Yeah. Yeah. So I I chose one that I think because obviously they're not linked to bio, the biodiversity topic anyway, um, and and um, I haven't put curriculum links there, but I'm sure you know there are links to the curriculum. I thought this one that you might want to look at later, how to make a water filter, does definitely link and it could be something that you could do at school as part of a, a lesson. It's quite a fun thing to sort of um, filter muddy water and make it clean again, basically. So that's one you can look at another time. But yeah, if you if you want to have a look there, if you've got kids at home as well and you're still looking for things to do, then uh, you can watch them with them too. But a lot of them feature me and my children, <laughs> children in the garden, basically. <laughs> Right, um, next one. Yeah. Uh, there we are. Yeah, so in conjunction with the videos on the Wild Forest School website under World Activities, I've also put lots of um, different activities that you can, can do. Um, and they're all on these themes, sticks, mud, colour and texture, magic, etc. Um, so along with the videos, there's more content as well. And there's, there's lots of simple activities you can do. Hands on learning, basically getting kids outside and mucky um, and links to other um, organisations resources too on that website. So that's worth having a look at. Sorry. Yep. And I think I've got, got two more, haven't I? So yes. um, we're now on day three of the Wildlife Trust's challenge, yearly challenge, so to do something uh, wild every day for 30 days in June. Um, so it's basically doing 30 simple fun uh, at random acts of wildness, we call it. And um, you can download a pack. We usually do um, physical packs, but because of social distancing and all the rest of this year, we, it wasn't been possible for the team to, to send out packs, but you can uh, go and register and get a pack and uh, it's lots of ways to encourage you to spend just five ten minutes doing something wild every day and their schools packs as well as family packs I think there's ones for care homes as well and businesses um, so it's worth having a, a look at that um, if you want to take part in in that challenge and then lastly my colleagues over at Rutland Water um, have been creating a lot of activities uh, to do with ospreys and birds as well in general. Um, they have an uh, osprey week every week. And I think it sort of coincides with when the ospreys return, so they're migratory birds. So they go away um, to Africa for the, the winter and then come back in March. They sort of hear from March to the end of August, September time. Um, 
so they have they as well as doing like a whole week themed week of activities there's lots more activities as well on this website as well as sort of primary and secondary uh, curriculum linked packs and resources as well um, so there's the link there it's quite long but you could just go to our website and search for it um, but yeah lots of things to do with ospreys brilliant thank you oh yes and this is my my hefty table that I created <laughs> thank you <laughs> yes yeah, so this will be available to see won't it later you can download it yeah, yeah. So where we upload the YouTube videos and the PowerPoints, um, we'll upload this as a Word file. Well, I think it's a PDF file I've turned it into so you can download. Oh, um, Martha's done a brilliant job of kind of lots and lots of different websites and other resources um, that people can access. Um, I think it's about six, seven pages long. It must took you a while, Martha, to make. It was quite it was quite useful to do, but I like I put it sort of by sort of uh animal type and habitat type so to help you so you know as we said you can't do everything all at once so if there's something you want to particularly focus on then you can just go to that section of the document and hopefully you'll find some of those links useful brilliant thank you martha that's fab um were there any particular questions from anyone um just while martha's definitely here at the moment um around anything that we've either not covered um or kind of sprung into people's minds at the moment And if not, if people think something a little bit later on, by all means, just pop it into the chat box um, and we can either pick it up over email or if, if we can't answer it. That's brilliant. Right. We'll move on. Um, by all means, Martha, by all means, today there might be some top tips here for you as well. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Amy's going to pick up a few um, a few projects. So we're just going to give you some a, a very quick insight into some of the sort of national projects that are going on that schools can tap into um any time during the year some of these some are sort of time specific but others are kind of all year round um and again way more than you'd ever probably need but it's just a case of picking out bits that you think might be useful um so Amy, i'll pass you over to you first of all sure hello um so the first one is woodland trust trees and they offer free schools for trees and communities uh there are two periods per year and they're currently taking applications for this november and um, you can buy packs all year round in the shop though if you want to actually spend money on them uh, and it's open to all schools across the UK and they are all native species as well which is great uh, and you can request up to four separate packs um, as long as you don't exceed 420 trees so that's quite a lot of trees to get you started. Um, the Woodland Trust also have a lot of resources for fun activities and ID guides as well which is on the next slide yep uh, and the links there um, so yeah, any sort of leaf ID that you wanted and lots of ideas and activities to get you started in biodiversity. Then uh, we have Naturehood, um, which is a community project from Earthwatch Europe, and they have a whole host of resources circled, centred on these uh, five creatures. So you've got common frog, early bumblebee, house sparrow, hedgehogs, and I've forgotten what the butterfly is, which is terrible. I would say tortoiseshell, I think. Martha, do you agree yeah, tortoiseshell? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they have there's some really nice resources actually and they've got lots of ID guides and Lee and I have actually done a couple of workshops and you can link it quite closely to the eco school campaign um, so we went to Avenue School and turned their hall into a wildflower meadow using lots of different flowers not real flowers printed on cards and um, so if that's something you're interested in we can come and help run that in your school yeah, um, I think eventually they're going to have nine species. So this is some key ones that they've picked out initially. Um, and each one you can kind of develop resort, well, they've developed resources so you can create habitats for specifically for the sparrow or for the frog. Um, so they are really nice, actually. And as Amy was saying, we've we've developed some resources we've done as a, one of the development groups. We add a lot of the eco teams in. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and you're also going to want to encourage all of these lovely biodiversity. Oh, well, you've gone quiet in for some reason. Oh, can you hear me? Is that better? I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, so yeah, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry, okay. just me then, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you want to encourage this biodiversity to come to your lovely school grounds. Um, so Leicester City Council can provide wildflower seed for that. Uh, if you get in contact with Donna, your contact details are down the bottom. 
and they can send out packs that you'd be starting and um, sending planting when you go back to school in September um, and they can provide lots of shelter for lots of different invertebrate species and then the invertebrate species feed the little mammal species um, so yeah so it's a get in touch with Donna if you fancy growing a wildflower meadow. Excellent. A uh, project that quite a few of you have probably heard of or maybe been involved with is the pollination project that happened, uh, finished last year. Um, so that was run by Learning Through Landscapes and I know 12 of our schools um, were involved in this and it was about developing, like the name suggests, uh, pollination friendly um, grounds. So again, it was giving schools lots of ideas. Um, that project has ended, but lots of the legacy resources are on their website still. Um, so the web links there just for pollination. Um, and it gives you lots of case studies of what schools did um, and they, they taught you through some of the problems they had, like the uh, the gardeners come and mow down all the fields that they just planted and that kind of thing. Um, so they give you lots of top tips and ideas about what they've, what's gone well in schools and what things kind of just to be aware of. And again, they've got lots of surveys. The Opal surveys as well, I think we've got a box in the office still. Um, so if anybody wants some of those um, as physical ones rather than printing, I'm sure we've got some um from that project still so just just get in touch if you want to do that one um, and the city nature challenge is one that we participated in a couple of years ago in leicester um, so city nature started four years ago um, and it's it's looking at lots of different species across the world not just in in uh, leicester um, and they use an app that's called iNaturalist, which i'll talk about in a second um, but it's really useful you can do this with children really easily um, and they usually have a focused um, 48 hours where they do a challenge and the idea is to identify as many species um, within sort of your city boundary. You can go into sort of a league table and things. Uh, this one was in April, um, so we didn't participate this year, but you can kind of have a look at this and use it any year or any time um, with some of their resources and things. So the iNaturalist app, if people haven't seen it, is, is genuinely is fantastic. Um, you do have to download an app which you can use on an iPad or a phone. Um, so I know a lot of schools have got tablets and things these days. So you just download the app, which is free, no cost. Um, you take a picture of the plant or the animal. Um, it doesn't need to be wild, not a zoo animal. And it will then try and identify that species straight away um, by just mapping it. So those two pictures there are ones that I took, uh, one in Sheffield and one in Bristol and it identified it right down to species level um, from just the photo, which I was generally was quite surprised by. Um, animals, you think maybe it can identify quite quickly, but plants, it can distinguish um, even without flowers on, it'll distinguish leaf colours and shapes and things. Um, so it'll give you the identification uh, and then you upload it to the website. So you can clear a generic log on for the school so it's not individual kids doing it. Um, and then what will happen eventually is, um, if it doesn't identify it, um, then other sort of professional botanists, um, zoologists can then check them and ID it and confirm. Um, but generally it'll identify it straight away for you. Um, so that's something we did a couple of years ago at Catherine Junior. So the whole school kind of over an afternoon came out um, and spent literally 15 minutes just sort of running around taking pictures of animals and plants um, and then uploading it to the website. Um, and like I say, again, if you create a generic log on, all the iPads will use the same password um, so it doesn't identify individual children or anything. Um, and it's just kind of a nice way of, of doing that. If you haven't got internet access, it will take the picture and store it. So when you take the tablets back inside, it'll just connect back up and upload them. Um, so it does work even if you haven't got a live internet connection. Um, and again, you can download that for personal use. Um, it's completely free. Um, and it helps when you're trying to identify animals and plants in school that you've no idea what they are. So yeah, really good app. I think that's really useful. Um, Bug Life is, is another big sort of national organisation. Um, so Bug Life work on, um, as it suggests there, uh, anything to do with invertebrates and conservation of invertebrates. So they have quite a few flagship projects. Um, the, B, the Bee Lines is one that I know in Leicester we've done um, for a number of years. And we did have a, an officer that was based in Leicester for a couple of years, creating buzzing hotspots. But again, lots of resources on their website um, to download and link up with some of the national projects that they're involved in. And then the last one for me before I pass back to Amy is the BioBlitz Leicester. Um, so most years we do a BioBlitz. So that was kind of the equivalent of the City Challenge. And we do that for, again, two days. 
Um, oh, I've put 24 hours there. I think it's 48 hours, actually. Um, so over a couple of days of looking for species in Leicester. Um, so we do usually do something with a group of schools. So, for example, here there's some pictures to do with Overdale Juniors um, down at their park near where their school is. Um, but usually that happens each year and we invite local schools to come and do some biodiversity um, searching. And usually we get sort of in the region of about five, six hundred species each year when we do this. Um, you could do this at any time if you call it just a bioblitz yourself. And it is literally just going out and looking for lots of species. So you could use the app um, to do that or you could use books and things. So that's just another sort of opportunity. Um, I'll pass back to Amy. Okay. Uh, so there's a couple of projects from the RSPB as well. As Martha mentioned earlier, the uh, Big Schools Bird Watch that takes place in January every year. So it's already happened this year, but over 2,300 schools took place last year, um, took part last year, can't speak today. Um, <laughs> but obviously, as Martha said, you don't just need to do it in January. There are birds around all year, so the resources are really good to sort of do it whenever you want. Um, and the resources are age tailored as well, so that you can use it for primary and going upwards. Uh, the RSPB also do the Wild Challenge, which is a, an award scheme that's free, and so you can take part. Um, and it's got two sections, so help at nature and experience nature. And there's lots of different projects that you need to complete to get go up through bronze, silver and gold award. Um, personally, I've had a quick look and wild weather looks great. I think everyone should do that. Um, so it's just a, another way of getting involved in nature and hopefully getting an award. Yeah, and I think that one's for individual children, or you can do it as a whole class. Um, so e each child could do this themselves and do their own challenge, or you could do the whole group doing the same one. Um, so there's some flexibility, and again, there's no cost to that. You just upload some evidence of photos. Oops, sorry, uh, and another big survey that goes on every year is the Big Butterfly Count. So it takes part this year from February, February, January. <laughs> Should go home. Um, July the 17th, so sort of right at the very end of the school year. Um, so it's sort of, again, you can reuse the resources at any time. Um, and um, I think this is one we mentioned last time with the school grounds one, but learning through landscapes, um, obviously a big national charity, but they also do various grant schemes. So there's one that's called Local School Grants, um, which I know a couple of schools in Leicester have been successful. Um, it's not open at the moment, but I presume it probably will be in the autumn term. So the schools apply for up to £500 of equipment, um, a training course, um, and then involving the students with what they're doing. Um, but again, that's a really good opportunity sort of for the children to pick out things that they might want to use. So a lot of them are like biodiversity kits. So it's got like, um, like Martha was saying, it's got like the nets and the pooters and other bits of kits that you maybe won't be able to buy otherwise. Um, but again, that's something just to have a think about. And the training course um, is for the staff around. It could be a biodiversity one or it could be an eco school theme one. So again, it's some free CPD that they deliver in school um, for a couple of hours. So it could be a twilight. Um, I know some of our schools have done that. It's been really good. Um, and then this is the blue, uh, the blue campaign, um, which I, we'd not heard of until recently. Um, but I think it is literally as simple as you leave in an area that's wild. Um, and you put a blue heart in that area that kind of represents what this is. Um, and it is as simple as that. So it might be that you've got a bit of a meadow at the back of the school or something, and you could put a blue heart. Um, these are made out of wood and just painted blue, um, but you could do it as a plaque on the wall, or it could be something that the children take home to it at their own place. Um, but it is just simple as kind of you sticking that up to show that this isn't just left as a mess, but it is deliberately um, creating an area that that wildlife can live in. Um, they've got on their website, you can buy them. So it's like, a, I think it's a charity themselves. So you can buy these hearts to put up, but it is otherwise you're just simple as sort of painting one and popping them in. Um, and again, that could be something that children could do at home, um, especially at the moment, children could do their own wildlife area and take pictures, put them up on social media, um, which would be quite nice as well. So that's maybe something we'll look at linking to our campaign. Um, and then just what I briefly mentioned before was um, that we are working uh, with our parks team and with our landscaping team around um, some advice to schools about reducing the use of herbicide um, and about increasing wildlife flower 
and uncut grass edges on fields. Um, so we're going to be working with a couple of schools at the moment um, on kind of getting that right. And then we'll be rolling that out to other schools in autumn. Um, so that's so that senior management can then look at options about um, having areas of school that aren't mowed or not mowed as often. Um, but again, just kind of implications of what that would be around um, perhaps the quality of what those areas are or other things. So that's just, just to be aware of we're working on that at the moment, but that'll come out through the extra net um, probably in autumn. And then lots of curriculum links. I'm just going to pass you back to you, Amy, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. So yeah, lots of useful curriculum links and just picking out a couple. Um, science, obviously investigating a variety of insects and birds and different plants. Um, geography, drawing a map of the school grounds. And then my favourite one there is listening and noting bird song. Very important to listen to the birds. And then all of the surveys obviously link quite well into maths and numeracy. Um, counting things and making graphs and diagrams. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so that's it for our projects. Um, some few more things that we need to discuss. Um, so in February 2019, the council declared a climate emergency and we are encouraging schools to do the same. So we've provided some resources that are on our extranets and you can get the links to these pages as well. And we are encouraging schools to go to their governing body and their trustee boards to declare an emergency in school. Uh, so we've put together a, for, a template for an action plan, uh, which we can help you with as well. Um, we've also provided a resource pack that sort of links all of the eco topics into where you can make carbon savings. And we've also got a template there so you can put in the name of your school and then we can send that to your governing body and trustee board as well uh, to get them on board. And all of the links are under that link there. Um, other opportunities, so we've still got the UN Climate Change Learn Online, which is a free course um, you can carry out. And the Off School website has still got lots and lots of resources on there. And that's from a Leicester-based company, the SDSA. Um, so if you're running out of ideas to entertain the kids, uh, head there, definitely. Um, and I've just left those links up, sorry. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, and I've just left up those links um, on the PowerPoint that's got some other grant opportunities and things. So if you are looking for some funding, um, the top ones are linked to the nature grants and then the other two are just some general lists um, for people to have a look at. Um, but if you've got specific things you want to sort of talk about, just drop us an email. And now's your chance for questions. If anyone's got anything um that they were interested in i'm just having a look through the chat box just to make sure we've not missed anything uh, uh i think sarah asked about what happened to the frog um survey for learning through landscapes i don't know is the answer to that one i'm afraid um i'll see what we find out about that one uh, i don't think there's anything else particular i think people had asked down the chat box did anyone have any questions either um, by all means, unmute un, un yourself. Um, I'll pop things in the chat box. Otherwise, we shall move on. Okay. Um, so, just kind of the next bits is um, we've got our next webinar, which is next week on global citizenship and fair trade, um, and then the healthy living, and then the marine topic. Um, and then our last one that we're going to have just before the end of term, a couple of weeks before, is how to submit for your green flag. And we'll talk people through how to do that um, with the other kind of applications and things. Um, and then just to very much finish off, um, that's all our social media. If people do want to have a look at on Facebook or Twitter, uh, we do have Instagram and we've got YouTube where we'll put this up um, this afternoon. And if you've got any questions um, for any of us, just drop an email. Um, to eco-schools at leicester.gov.uk. Um, so I think without further ado, I think first of all, thank you very much, Martha. Um, absolutely brilliant. Lots of useful information there and the uh, resource pack that we're going to put up on the website for people to use. Hope it's got lots of ideas. Thank you, Leah. Pleasure. That's right. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much, Amy, for helping as always. Um, Amy does a lot of the legwork for these PowerPoints. Um, it looks quite smooth and it always is, but it's a lot of like work behind us putting them all together. Um, so hopefully people are finding these useful. I know quite a few people watch these afterwards on YouTube. Um, but thank you very much, everyone.
good to see a few people again and we'll uh, hopefully speak to you all soon. Bye. Thanks, Thanks. Bye, bye now. Bye.